Hello to everyone listening to us. I am Renata, the conference Teverishia host. And our guest today is Lawrence Cohen. Lawrence is a psychologist, author, uh, Playful Parenting, which is my favorite book, and also a family consultant. Hello, Lawrence. Hi there, Renata. It's so, great. so good to meet you and to see everyone. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I uh, remember reading your book and one of the comments that I loved was about how this book specifically helped parents to go into connection with children through the world, which is play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How have yeah. you discovered that? I mean, how do you find this way? <laughs> yeah. I you know, when I trained as a psychologist, I was not a father. Um, I had not had much experience with children and I didn't know what I was doing. And I felt that the message I got from my professors was the parents are screwing everything up. <laughs> um, and they, they made life horrible for this poor child and, and you should go and just help the child and um they didn't say those words but i think that was the message that i that i heard and so naturally i was not very helpful for the families i don't think um and then i became a father and i thought oh it's actually very hard it's actually uh we're untrained and we're unpaid and um and it's so everybody says it's so important it's the most important job in the world but it's not treated as the most important job in the world mm -mm. because even jobs that are much less important are given people are given training and they're paid for it so that really changed my attitude and i thought i really need to learn about this and see what it means to be a father and and so i looked around, I saw friends and other people, and I just looked around to see what did I admire? What did I respond to? And I realized that what I really connected with, um, what really made sense to me was the close, warm relationship. This was more important than anything. And I saw right away, there are two main ways to get there. And one of them, as you mentioned, is play. Uh, this is children's world. And if we get on the floor and play with them and really play, not just, oh, okay, uh, but engage in it, um, then children light up. <clears throat> the other main way to connect is emotional understanding. You know, we want children to be logical, to be rational. But in fact, they're more emotional than logical. You know, the same thing is true of us, but we like to think of ourselves as being logical and rational, mm -hmm. but um, children don't even fake it. So they're just full of emotions. I used to say when my daughter was about two years old or three years old, it seemed like she just invented sadness or she just invented anger. It's like, it was such a pure, intense feeling. It was like, she wasn't copying anybody that she saw in a movie. She wasn't thinking, this is how you act when you're sad or afraid or angry. It's like the emotion just poured out. And like most people, my first reaction is, get that emotion away from me. It's too much. You have to stop. I can make you feel better with, oh, here's a little toy. I'll make you feel all better. Or... Um, don't talk to me like that, or don't do that, or everything's fine, everything's fine. And uh, uh, fortunately, that didn't work. You know, I say fortunately, because sometimes it seems to work, but really, it's not working. A child can hush those emotions temporarily, but where do they go? You know, I had a teacher who said, if you send your feelings down to the basement they don't go away there's a gym in the basement and your feelings work out and they get stronger and stronger and stronger and then wow. they come flying out later so i love that idea hmm. so um so with my daughter and later with my son it's these techniques just didn't work and so 
they just had their feelings and I realized what I can do is to be with them Mm. don't have to change it don't have to fix it I can say tell me all about it I can say oh that broke your heart that was so sad or whoa that was scary or oh you're so mad you're so mad and this was an incredible road to connection so play and emotional understanding are these royal roads to connection did you have um playfulness in you when you became a dad I was very anxious I was an anxious kid um I was an anxious adult um I you know I had a sense of humor I told jokes but I didn't really understand playing and I learned it from my daughter um when she was a baby and I learned it from watching her with other people who are more naturally playful Mm-hmm. I shouldn't say naturally because I think I was naturally playful, but for me, the anxiety and other things that happened to me got in the way of that mm-hmm. natural playfulness. I think we are all naturally playful unless something's happened to zap it out of us. That's how I felt too when I um, became a mom. I was like, nah, I'm going to wait until they are like, you know, five, six, we can have conversations. Conversations, you know, right. We can speak about things as like playing, like playing what? Like on the ground, like doing right. what? And, and, um, right. and remember reading your book and feeling some kind of uh, playfulness inside me, like maybe this hidden playfulness from my mm-hmm. own, you know, when I was a little girl, mm-hmm. but then I was like, yeah. I had to really dig deep to find it within myself. Yeah, yeah. So maybe something that listeners can think about is what are your early memories of play from your childhood? And this is part of awakening your own playful heart. Mm. And you may discover joyful memories that you forgot about. Mm. you may discover no memories and then that's interesting and that's important you may discover painful memories where you were lonely or you were left out or no one played with you and whatever you find this is important Um, it's a step in finding that playful heart inside the other thing people often find when they ask themselves this question what do I remember from play in my childhood is that we did risky things that we would never let our children yeah. do now <laughs> and we're okay so maybe we cannot hover so much and be careful be careful be careful hmm. um, maybe we can um let children take risks hmm. you know be smart about it be nearby but keep our mouth shut and not say don't do that be careful be careful be careful um and let them decide for themselves what's safe can we talk a little bit about uh the importance of play in our children's life why play is so important to children um i learned a lot from studying animal play Hmm. and um there's research that shows that the smarter the animal the more they play um so um uh, lots and lots of animals play and when animals play it's mostly rough and tumble play uh rough housing kind of play Mm -hmm. um but whales dolphins monkeys chimpanzees um these they just really play a lot and so what i take from that is the world is very complex Um, we have these big brains but they start out without much information inside without much knowledge they have this incredible capacity but not much in there yet and play is a great way to explore the world to explore what your body can do explore what your mind can do and play is great for this because there's no um you can make mistakes and they're not life and death Mm. um you can test uh, test things out and it's okay. Um, you can try out things that you can't do yet, but you try them and try them and try them. Remember when my granddaughter was about two and a half and she was learning to climb upstairs, 
She just wanted to go upstairs and downstairs and upstairs and downstairs. And she had this intense concentration and she could do this for way longer than I could stand because I would get <laughs> bored. But I knew she's learning, she's playing, it's play because she's completely engrossed in it. Time disappears. Mm. There's this, sometimes play is giggly and laughing and sometimes play is more serious concentration. Mm. And what makes it play is you're choosing to do it and time disappears and you don't care. If you get it wrong, you just do it again. You just want to keep doing it for the joy of it. And, you know, children don't need to be taught to climb stairs. Like, okay, now we're having a lesson on climbing stairs. They will want to do it just for the joy of another adventure, another challenge. Hmm. And uh, this is where play comes in. And so we've really missed the boat in the way we set up schools because we say, stop playing, sit down, mm. memorize this. And the other uh, way of talking about this, about why play is so important has to do with the brain. And this was, this really was eye opening to me when I learned this, that we think of the brain, there's trillions of nerve cells and they're all interconnected and they don't really go one by one. They're organized into these different pathways. And we have a pathway for each emotion and we have a pathway for each sense and smell and hearing. And we have a pathway for small movements and big movements. We have a pathway for language and for memory. So all these different pathways and the brain develops best when a lot of these pathways are activated at the same time. And especially if the social pathway, like you and I here talking together, yeah. Um, if that's activated, then the other, all the other pathways light up brighter. Okay. So if I was alone, just thinking about playful parenting, it would be like, Ugh. but we're talking about it. You're listening. And so it lights up brighter. So think about a normal school day. Mm -hmm. You're sitting still. You're not allowed to talk to the person next to you. You're doing one thing over and over again. So you're trying to, to say this one pathway is the only important one, is the only one you should be involved in. Shut off all the other ones. This is not how the brain develops. We turn off the social one and we expect the child to learn. They don't learn their best. Now think about play. Think about a, a three or four-year-old doing dramatic play or six and seven-year-old making up their own games. Mm. Um, their whole brain is lit up. Mm. Their pathways are engaged of their language, their emotions, their sensations, their body, their memory. All of these are active all at the same time. And they're interacting. And so the social pathway is activated. And so the learning that goes on is much richer, much deeper. The brain development is much better. And yet we look at children playing, we think they're wasting their time. They're not learning anything. Mm. That's so true. They, like <laughs> they play, like there's something diminutive about, like they only play. Yeah, like, only playing. No big right. deal, like they're only playing. That's so true what you told about your daughter. I remember my daughter being maybe two and a half and we would go to a playground and she would stop at the gate and spend, yeah. I don't know, maybe 15 minutes opening, closing. Yes, opening, yes. closing. You would never get to go to the playground. <laughs> right. Because she right. would spend the whole time on opening, closing. And I was like, what the heck? Like, why, why do you have to do this? What's right. happening here? Until right. I get that, you know, that as you say, this is how way of learning the world, how it works, you know, how I right. open, and close until something right. clicks in there. And then she's like, okay, right. I got this. <laughs> exactly. And it's so ironic because um, I've had that same experience and my initial, my reaction is, come on, we have to go to the park. But then later it's, they're sitting at doing their homework. We want them to be doing their homework and they're wanting to do a million different things. And we say, no, no, sit and focus on this one thing. Well, earlier when they were sitting and focusing on the one thing, the gate, 
we tell them, why are you still doing that gate? Yeah. yeah. We have to get to the playground. So you know, I see this at a museum or a, um, a children's exhibit kind of thing. The parents are saying, look at this, look at this, look at this. Well, let the child choose their own pace. If they want to run around, that's fine. If they want to stay at one thing for the whole time, this is how they develop focus and concentration. And so we, I, I don't know what to call it. It's like shooting ourselves in the foot. You know, we want them to have focus and concentration. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but I we, guess our we interrupt way. it when we see it. Yeah, yeah our yeah. way. The way we <laughs> yeah. see it, because when it's way, way, we're like, no, something's wrong. <laughs> like we should change right, it. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so how how do we use play to connect? Mm -hmm. Say, where mm -hmm. do we start? Like, what mm -hmm. do we do? Mm -hmm. um, I think you start by getting in close and watching. Mm. And so... I see what you're doing. I'll do it also. Um, if the child is playing with blocks, we can sit nearby. We can hand them blocks. Um, we can say, wow. We don't want to be evaluating and praising or, or punishing, but we can say, wow. I just got to interrupt one second because the, um, yeah, the sun, the sun came yeah. out. <laughs> not expecting the sun today so we just join in um, we sit with them um, one thing that was helpful for me is I would set a timer for 10 minutes mm. because I can do anything for 10 minutes if you think about all day long I have to be and I have to be in this playful mode all day long I have so many other things to do it's so boring and I can't do it well for 10 minutes you can be extra enthusiastic you can mm. be warm. Mm. Um, another way to start uh, is to take videos of your child playing. Usually we take videos when we think our children are being cute. But if instead you take a picture of boring things, you know, they're just doing whatever they're doing. They're just playing. Uh, and take a long video, take 10 minutes of video. And then watch it together with your child. And when, if they're old enough to talk about it, then you ask them, what were you doing here? Now, you're not interrogating them. Mm. You're curious. Like, oh, what happened here? Looks like you really ran into a problem here. How did you figure that out? And children love to see themselves in a the video mm. and they love to talk about their play and we're treating their play very seriously. Um, the... Um, I like to add a dramatic element. So this is another way to get started in play. So um, you're doing just any activity and you pretend that your bear's doing it. Mm. Or um, you pretend that um, you're going to grandma's house or you, um, you pretend that you know, there's elves and fairies, you know, whatever, anything pretending that that mm -hmm. grabs you or that that your child is interested in. Um, your child is smart. They know that this is not real. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, this is kind of like putting on a play hat. Mm -hmm. um, like playing a character. Yeah, play a character or a, yeah, a role or a setting. Um, you're having dinner and you just can pretend you're at a restaurant. Mm. Mm. Um, and this adds a play element and lightens everything up. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I remember a story from your book when you told a story about you playing with your daughter and she invited you to play with dolls and you were like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> like how could that be i mean this is so boring and when i remember you describing how you first you like put them side by side by they maybe hair color <laughs> and by the size then by i don't remember whatever you know criteria you had but like this is really about like as you say it's it's 10 minutes i can do 10 minutes and mm -hmm. i'm here fully present 
okay, let's figure this out. So I have those yeah. dolls I have to play with. Okay, right. I'm gonna do something <laughs> with those right. dolls. Right, right, exactly. Mm. And it took me a while to realize I don't have to know how to play with dolls. I can just watch her. And that's how I'll learn. Yeah. Um, that our children know how to play. And so uh, we watch them. We expose them to some interesting materials. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I'll just have a little aside about toys that parents often are drawn to the ones that are really flashy, the newest things, and they have electronics in them and all this. And um, to me, those toys do all the work that the best kinds of toys are a stick, a box, uh, blocks, a doll, Mm -hmm. um, where the child does the work, and I mean the you know I use the word word work mm -hmm. loosely. You know yeah. they're playing, they're 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 putting their imagination onto it. Mm -hmm. um, the toy is toys are not good for teaching. Um, so uh, simple uh, with many possibilities. You know, mm -hmm. stick could be ten different things yeah. in in a, in a minute. Yeah. I remember visiting our kids' preschool and they had this show for parents when we let parents see what children know how to do, you know. And uh, I remember they had those blocks and I guess the teacher had a plan somehow what mm. those blocks should look like. <laughs> yes. And, and then my son was like, he was building other things. It was like, but see if i put it that way that could be a tower and if i put it that yeah. way that could be a dragon and teacher was like no 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 this is not <laughs> that... what it is like no 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 no. this is not what it is i was like you are missing the point exactly. Right? Like, like, exactly like let them play let them have this creativity you know and uh right. yeah right children are the experts and yes one thing about play is there's not one right answer mm it's open-ended and so i think this is this pressure that early childhood education feels yeah. Yeah. to get ready for school that that's their purpose is so we have to prepare children for school where there's one right answer and you're punished if you get the wrong answer yeah. and you're rewarded if you get the right answer but play is not like this and in fact instead of making early childhood like school we should make school like early childhood. Yeah. We should take away those tests where there's one right answer and have children explore things and be able to show everything that they know. Um, you know, you, you, you hear about great scientists, inventors, discoverers, explorers. Um, these were people who, um, you know, were like your son. They're like, mm. no, that's not, that's not mm -hmm. just a block, that's a dragon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, I think playing is somehow like living. I mean, you take a decision, yeah. you make a decision, and then it leads to some kind of consequences. And they yeah. might be different. Like, right. I put this block over there, and then it might fall, or it might stay there. Right. I don't know. I add another one. Right. and It's like, as parents, you want to jump in and like, don't do that that way because it's gonna fall. You know, exactly. like I can see that it's gonna oh, fall. Or like, I, yeah. yeah, please go. I do this all the time, and I really and I just you know kick myself after I do it because I know better. But mm -hmm. my granddaughter's building, and I'll oh I'll fix it so it won't fall because I can't stand for her to be frustrated or sad. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute, no, this is her chance to discover and how will she learn otherwise and also how if i can't handle her being frustrated mm -hmm. how can she handle being frustrated mm -hmm. so i need to be able to step back let her be frustrated let it fall and sometimes if you do that it's like it didn't fall mm -hmm. right yeah. something i just i couldn't i didn't think that would work yeah and it did work it did yeah. <laughs> So I guess it all breaks down to handling emotions. That's why we may be like no resistant going there because we know like 
We're yeah. gonna play, we're gonna build something. When we have all this drama around this, I, I don't wanna like handle it. Like I wanna be out. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, emotions are, are definitely intertwined and in our emotions and our children's emotions. Mm. And so um, I think you're right. We can't talk about play without talking about parents' emotions, which could be boredom, <laughs> You know, it could be annoyance, like who's going to clean all this up? You know, I'm going to be the one cleaning it up. Um, could be worry, you know, oh, they should be learning. I, I did some work with a toy company a while back. Mm -hmm. And they said, if they, any toy at all, if they put A, B, C, one, two, three on it, it sells more. Oh, could be a toy that has nothing to do with reading or math or anything like that. But if they put that on a toy, it sells more because parents are like, oh, this is what's important. My this is education. <laughs> education. But that's not, that's not the purpose of play. It's not mm -hmm. necessary. And so mm -hmm. um, we had this worry. So yeah, I was saying that because, you know, why do we buy that? Because we're worried about our children's future success. Mm -hmm. We missed this moment now. Yes. we're so worried about the future um so we have all these emotions and then we have mm. leftover emotions from our own childhood mm. maybe we were lonely maybe we got hit or yelled at um, maybe we had a best friend who moved away and and so play you know can trigger you know when, when we get down on the floor and we really engage with our children somebody else shows up Mm. And that's our child inside. Mm. And mm. I think that we have two different kinds of inner children who show up. Mm. And one is joyful, this wonder child who's like, wow, this is so fun. And this is one of the great things about having children um, or being with children. If you're a mm. teacher or a friend is your inner child gets to come out to play again. And you see things through the world, the eyes of a child. Mm. But also your hurt inner child can show up too. Mm. And, oh, I was lonely when I was this age. Or I was, you know, locked in my room when I was that age. Or my parents were fighting all the time when I was this age. Or, or there was violence in the street and, or in my home. And, and so we have a constriction. We have a fear. We have a, a anger or hurt. And we don't really, often we don't even realize it. Mm. All we're aware of is I don't feel like doing that. Mm. But underneath, it's the whole rest of the iceberg is all those old leftover feelings. Um, so if you don't want to play, a great question to ask yourself is, what's going on in me? What's being triggered right now? Mm. What was going on in my life when I was this age? And if you don't know, then ask your parents, you know, if they're around to ask. Mm. I remember when my daughter was six months old, um, my parents were visiting, my daughter was six months old, and I started like just choking, like I had trouble breathing and swallowing and all of a sudden, and, and it happened more if I was with my daughter. And so just, I don't know, it occurred to me to ask my mother, because she was there visiting, it's like, what was going on when I was six months old? And she said, oh, that's when we went away and left you with your grandmother. I was like, oh, because my, I didn't remember this. I was mm -hmm. six months old. Mm -hmm. But I knew from later on that my grandmother would force me to eat. She was like, eat, 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 eat. You know, that's the kind of grandmother she was. So I imagine like I was six months old and I missed my mommy and... She was like, eat, 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 eat. And so here, all that came rushing back. And if I hadn't asked the question and found that out, I would have just thought, oh, there's something wrong with my throat. I've got to go to the doctor. Or there's something wrong with me. Um, or I would think, I wouldn't even think about that. It would just be like, I have this when I'm with my daughter, so I'm just going to stay at work longer and not be yeah. around her, which is so unfortunate. So. I was lucky that time because I was able to see exactly mm -hmm. the, the cycle and the trigger and everything. 
often it's more mysterious and we just think, okay, maybe something was happening when I was three or when I was six or, um, and I might not know exactly what it is, but I can just say, okay, little six-year-old Larry, you you can play with us too. (laughs) What about children emotions? So then, yeah, so there's another reason we need to be, you know, clear about our emotions Mm -hmm. because Otherwise, our children's emotions will just really knock us over. Mm. So the metaphor I use for children's emotions is they're like a river. They need to flow. Mm -hmm. Usually we see an emotion and we think it must have stopped. (laughs) Maybe there's some okay emotions that are that are fine, but anger, fear, sadness, temper tantrum like this has to stop. Mm. So we put a dam in the river. And what happens? A flood. Mm. You can stop it for a while, but then you get more flooding. Mm. So we want the emotion to flow. So the parent's job is to be the riverbank, to be this side of the river, help contain that emotion. We don't take it away. It's not our emotion. It's their emotion. But we help contain it. And we do that by saying, oh, I see that you're sad. Oh, I see that you're angry. You don't say this like a robot. I see a lot of parents trying this. Oh, you are very angry. And they say, I tried reflecting the child's emotions and they got mad. It's like, you weren't reflecting the emotion. You were a robot. So to really reflect the emotions, like, oh, that made you so mad. When I said no more, uh, no more cookies, you got so mad at me. Oh, you were mad. You just wanted to throw things. You were so mad. Yeah. Mm. Um, sometimes just that reflection the child relaxes other times they're like yeah so then you can say let's go find something you can throw safely get some of that mad at Mm. let's go punch some pillows together Um, go to your room until you can smile then what happens what happens to that energy of that emotion you know they're either going to destroy everything in their room or they're going to build up this resentment of you Mm. or they're going to have a fake smile Mm. and you know how creepy it is to be around Mm -hmm. people who have that fake smile oh yes everything's fine (laughs) i really want to kill you but i'm smiling (laughs) um so we don't want to train children to do that so we accept the emotion the riverbank doesn't decide how fast the river goes how deep the river is how cold it is how warm it is the riverbank is just right there i'm right here with you the temper tantrum, we just want to stop it, right? We stop it with threats. We stop it with bribes. Mm. But what about if we say, I'm right here? And then maybe we're not too close because the child's, you know, kicking. And, mm. you know, if you get kicked by a child in a tantrum, well, that's because you were standing too close. I can't really blame the child. Now, if they come running after you, then you might have to hold them, you know, gently and but firmly. But if they're on the floor kicking and all that and they hit you that's because you got too close Mm -hmm. but you don't have to walk away and ignore them because what is where does that leave a child i'm overwhelmed with this emotion i can't handle it i don't know what's what i don't know what's up and what's down i'm totally taken over and you're gone this is a horrible feeling Mm -hmm. and so you just back up a little bit and you say i'm right here i'm here um you you know maybe turn a little bit away so the child sees the profile of your face because if you're if a child's overwhelmed with emotion intense eye can't contact is just too much Mm -hmm. but turn your back and then oh where are you Mm -hmm. um so turn a little bit away you know the child's sad oh you're just so sad Mm -hmm. but we want to tell them it's you know it's nothing you know yeah this really bothers me there was there was a program i heard about a program in schools it was supposed to teach emo- social and emotional education mm. but they taught the children you should have little feelings about little things and big feelings about big things and i couldn't believe this like this is not how emotions work mm. we all know we have big emotions about little things mm-hmm. every one of us mm. You know, and sometimes we have little emotions about big things. You know, it just, it doesn't work that way. 
And so if a child is so upset about a little thing, it means that there's a big thing that they're not able to tell us about. Mm -hmm. And they're not able to tell us because maybe they don't remember the details. Maybe it's too hot to handle. They can't talk about it. Maybe they think we don't want to hear it. Um, so they'll bump their finger like that. And, ah! and we mm -hmm. say, that was nothing. Mm -hmm. You don't even have a mark. Well, then the child feels like whatever feeling was underneath that is being dismissed, yeah. um, invalidated. So instead it's, ah, my finger is like, oh, your finger, oh, let me see. Oh, wow, you know, you keep getting that finger poked. I wonder if there's some other feelings inside that are just mm. need to come out. I'm right here. <coughs> I think it's difficult for us because we feel this responsibility for their feelings and we feel that we somehow have to fix it. You know, whatever happens, like we have to fix it. So one way is handling it is like, don't feel like, you know, there's nothing like, you know, there's nothing. L let me show you something. And we come with a yeah. toy, you know, or an ice yeah. cream, you know, whatever. Yeah. Because we feel that once it's there, when the child show to us what he feels yeah. we need to fix it like this is our job exactly. to fix it and we have no clue how to do it exactly and so instead of you know i don't have any uh ideas for how to fix it I, what what i suggest is change your job description mm. your job <laughs> is not to fix it or change it your job is to accompany it your job is to witness it to be here to be present um, and it's a very different job. And the job is to help that feeling go through to completion. Mm. And so if a child hurts himself and they're crying and then they're, and then, uh, and then they want to run off to play, we're like, oh, good, you're done. Mm. But maybe you call them back and say, let me look at that finger again. And, and, oh boy, that was a big ow you got. And, and let's tell the story again about what happened. You were climbing and you slipped and you hit your finger and, and then maybe they cry a little more about it. And then the sun comes all the way out. Mm. And so now we know the feeling has fully completed instead of just, I cried a little bit, I got enough out to go on. Mm. Um, and you know, we see what happens with adults you now that we have pushed in so much that we really don't want to open it up because there's mm -hmm. so much in there that we backed up and pushed away, you know, or um, we let, a, it's like, okay, I'll let a little emotion out and then, okay, now I'm fine. We are afraid that if we open up, there is so much that will be coming out that there's no end to it. <laughs> like exactly. I have to somehow keep it, you know, like down there. <laughs> right, right, right. And this really makes us only half alive. Mm -hmm. right? It it interferes with uh, doing things that are creative because mm -hmm. if we start to write poetry or create art or draw or sing, it opens the door to what's inside mm. all those things open that door and if we're afraid to open the door then we're not going to do those things and the same with getting on the floor and playing the, the childhood play their their door is wide open the door to the unconscious that you know children another thing related to what we're saying is children will play and there's death and there's destruction and there's blood and and we think, oh, no, 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 that's terrible, that's terrible, that's terrible. It's not terrible. It's real life, and they're trying to figure it out, and they're doing it in their play. And, and you know, we, the Bible is full of death and, hmm. you know, terrible things that happen, right? I mean, wonderful things, too. But, you know, this we had this idea, children's play should be sweet and rainbows and, and hmm. unicorns and... Uh, that's fine if that's what's in there. But, you know, if the unicorn is getting exploded, then mm. uh, that's okay too. That's what I was telling earlier today uh, to a family who 
parents were afraid because they uh, children started to play war. Right. And I guess it's related to, you know, to the war in Ukraine right now, because yes, everyone yes. talks about it. Uh, they see mm. some images, you know, they speak about it at school. And, yeah. um, and parents were like, you know, how should we stop it? I mean, because they are playing uh, war at home. Yeah. Uh, should we do that? Absolutely. Children are smarter than adults when it comes to this. Mm. Children will naturally play about anything that confuses them or troubles them or gives them strong emotions. It could be a little thing like playing school. And you know, when my daughter played school, she was the strict teacher. She didn't get in trouble in school, mm -hmm. but the most emotionally important thing that happened in her classroom was when the teacher scolded some of the other kids. So that's what she played. Or it could be a big thing. It could be playing war. You know, it could be playing, um, you know, about fighting. It can be playing about uh, death, you know, it could be. Um, so children will play what's in their life and they'll play what's confusing. And if we give them our warm attention, um, then this play will be useful. It will be good for them. Um, if we don't let them play it, then what happens to the energy there? that was trying to come out. Mm. They might turn it on themselves. They might go and do it secretly. Um, they might go and do real aggression. Mm. So play, aggressive play is not aggression. Aggressive play is play. Mm. It's different from violence. And so playing war is play. And it's a perfectly good form of play. Um, if you want, you could say, Oh, looks like a lot of you soldiers are getting injured. I wonder where the hospital is. And mm -hmm. then maybe you don't know, force them, but maybe they'll take that as an idea and they'll build a hospital. Right. And so we can gently encourage them to think about rescue, not just about um, the violent part of war. Um, and um, or it's like, oh, okay, it's lunchtime. I think it's time for a peace negotiation, you know? So but you're not telling them you have to play a game about yeah. peace. You can't play a game yeah. about war. I remember that example from your book, like when, let's say, two siblings fight, and you know one is you know the good one, <laughs> one is the bad <laughs> one, right? And so instead of blaming, instead of saying how could you have done that, you know, like mm -hmm. you know better, you are like, oh, we need help. Like, could you be now, you know, the rescue team? And I need, you know, bandit. I need um, some water, maybe. I need something to clean. Uh, like, yeah. how to find, again, this, you know, like, balance mm -hmm. between what happened without blaming, but just, okay, so let's show us your other side, because you can also help. Right. You know, you can right. be also the one who helps. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so when, when there are these traumatic things happening in the world and children are exposed to war, whether it's on TV or in their home or outside the door, either way, um, it helps for them to think about the people who are rescuing, people who are helping, um, and to not, that we don't add to this, like people are bad, um, because you know your child's a person too so if people are bad what does that mean mm. um, and it's kind of like they are trying to make sense like so if we see yeah. that it's very like aggressively yeah so we could maybe tell ourselves okay so i can show them another like side of this like you know what but in war we also have like all these people who help yeah who rescue who bring food you know who mm -hmm. uh, like build shelters you know whatever it is like somehow yeah. counterbalance you know what exactly very yeah. dominant in their mind right and but not too much of that right so just a little of that because um like they're lightly. yeah no so, <laughs> let, yeah so you know it's it's fine if they're not if no one's getting injured yeah then bang, 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 you know, or you're the bad guy, we're the good guy, you know, it's, um, this is all very normal and very, very fine. Mm -hmm. um, 
children have been doing this forever and yeah yeah um and then this is not the cause of war you know i mean as grown-ups grown-ups do mm -hmm. wars you know not kids um, so i guess what we are saying is that we can also use play to address some i don't know let's say behavior problems right instead right. of like getting all serious like now we have right. to talk and i'm gonna tell right. you what's happening right we could use right. playfulness to address <clears throat> an issue yeah exactly so uh, i think about this two different ways so one way is we have a problem and we bring that problem over to the play zone so let's play a game about that right or we could think of it the other way um we have a problem and we bring play energy to the problem mm -hmm. so this could be an everyday thing like going to bed getting ready for bed yeah <laughs> and so how do you be playful about that is you might say oh uh, instead of me yelling at you about playing going to bed let's switch okay mm. you be the mommy i'll be the kid mm -hmm. um <laughs> and uh, you tell me to go to bed <laughs> And then they'll say all the things that you say, mm. the good and the bad. And you can whisper, it's like, should I be cooperative or should I be really a jerky kind of kid who doesn't do what you say? And they'll say, oh no, be a jerky kid. And so you say, I'm not going to bed. And you know, you, you check with your kid, you watch and it's like, cause you don't want to be making fun of them. You mm. want laughter. So mm. here's the two of you laughing at something that has been really anguishing before, and now you can laugh about it. Mm. Uh, sometimes in the moment is not the time to do this because you're too aggravated and it's mm. not the right time. So you do it in another time. So mm. before dinner, you say, you know what? Let's practice our bedtime fight. <laughs> now you were so tired when we do our bedtime fight. Let's have our bedtime fight now. Who do you want to be? <laughs> going to be the kid? Do you want to be the parent? Mm. um and all and already you're laughing about yeah yeah just the idea of that yeah so you bring play energy which is this light-hearted energy to a real problem and then you could do this with something more serious so a child has a serious illness and children will naturally want to play doctor mm. and they want to be the doctor right and so then you're like no 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 don't give me that injection get away from me ah oh you got me um and they get to be a powerful one or sometimes children will want to you know in their fantasy they'll want to punch and kick the doctors because the doctors did terrible things to them well that's not the time for a lecture that doctor saved your life you <laughs> should be grateful of course they know that and of course they're grateful and they have a whole lifetime for that but right now they're mad and it didn't feel like they were saving the, their life it felt like you were hurting me and so um, so then it can be like oh, i'm the doctor come and get me mm -hmm. and uh this is this is another game that i really love for any kind of a difficulty a child is facing you pretend to be that thing and then they tackle you and they grab you and they knock you to the ground so they conquer you. So it could be, I'm the mean kid at school, or I'm the difficult math problem, or mm. I'm the strict teacher, or I'm the nervous, um, you know, anxiety that you get when it's time for a party or time for a test. Mm. Um, anything that they're struggling with, you represent it, and then they have to fight you, and then they end up winning so this is what this is a game that it's good for them to hmm. uh to win at the end so that symbolically they have conquered and vanquished that problem so they have to work to win they have to really uh, and then they get you hmm. i love it what what about i think the most difficult emotion for parents is um anger like yeah. when kids get angry it's like we feel confronted, I guess. We feel like you yeah. says, us or them. <laughs> exactly. How could exactly. we play around anger? Is there a it's way? It's so hard because most of us were never allowed to be angry. Our parents had the full freedom to be angry at us. Mm. But we had no freedom to be angry at them. And this was very mm. unfair. And, and so 
when our children dare to be angry, then we remember all that. Mm. Now I'm finally the grown up, you know, so now you can't be angry, but children get angry. And so we take a breath and we remember anger is a normal emotion. Anger is not dangerous. No emotion is dangerous in itself. Mm. Actually trying to suppress emotions is what makes them dangerous. Mm. So we try to suppress them and they get, they explode and that's dangerous. So um, the, the, so what, so a breath, a reminder to myself is anger. It's okay. A reminder to myself, if I can't handle this anger, how can a child anger? They're just little. How can they handle this emotion? Mm. So I like to say this is a big feeling and together we can take care of this feeling. We can handle this feeling. Um, and that we remember, we remember the difference between symbolic expression and um, dangerous, violent expression. Mm -hmm. so what we usually do is to tell children use their words so they punch or they grab and we say use your words well we don't really mean that because you know i've seen parents say that and the kid starts cursing and swearing and, and then all these horrible words like you can't say this like you told me to use my words it's like you know use nice words it's like wait a minute i can't use nice words about anger i mean can you use nice words about anger if you're really angry with somebody, you don't have any nice words. So mm -hmm. symbolic, we have to expand. It's not just, I am angry. That's not the only acceptable way to express it. You know? mm -hmm. uh, nobody's getting hurt when I do that. Mm -hmm. um, tearing up a piece of paper, nobody's getting hurt. Yeah, Nobody's getting hurt. Um, and these are symbolic expressions. These are just, uh, it sounds, it's words, it's, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's no injury. Um, and so this is acceptable expression of anger. Um, I like to teach children a few more ways. So one of my favorite ones with anger is to take a cloth and you twist it both ways like that one hand this way one hand that way and stare at it with like laser eyes mm -hmm. and you can make a sound like a growling sound like mm -hmm. and you know so much of what we tell children is calm down calm down calm down well that's wonderful to be calm <laughs> but it's not enough usually for kids like i i'm a fan of mindfulness but I don't think it's the whole answer. I don't think we should just tell kids like, uh, you know, oh man, I just, oh, I don't feel that. It's just will mm -hmm. fade away. I think more often it has to come out. It has mm -hmm. to actively come out and be completed. And then the last little bit you can get out with that mindful, you know, mm -hmm. being peaceful. Um, so, um, <clears throat> You know, get away from me, you doctors. You don't bring those needles anywhere near me. Ah, I'm going to kick you. This is just symbolic, right? Mm -hmm. They're not actually going to kick the doctor. If they do start to kick the doctor, then you stop them. Mm. You say, this can do something like this in a pretend, but not for real. We don't actually kick anybody for real. Mm. Um, some children need a few reminders of that, but a gentle reminder. Mm. Um, and None of this will work if less you can be in touch with your own anger. Mm. Um, one way to get more uh, insight into your own mm. um, emotions is to make a little chart. And I highly recommend this. You make a chart and down one side is there's me, there's my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, everyone in your family grandparents you know if you spent a lot of time with them or live with them and across the top is every emotion okay anger happiness sadness fear any other ones that are important and then in each square you write how did that person express that emotion growing up mm. it's really fascinating <laughs> so some people it's like silence 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 <laughs> silence you know or it's i don't know how you know or um, 
you know, or for, for anger, you know, mother hit, father yelled, I kept it all inside. Well, this is very important to know. This is going to have a big impact on your first impulse of what you do when your child is angry. Um, and, um, and then, you know, and, and so this is, this is not just to be mad at somebody or to blame them. This is just for knowledge about mm -hmm. what it was like, you know, that our parents were overwhelmed, you know, I mean, they, they did their best and they tried hard and, mm -hmm. you know, their lives, most of, for most of us, our parents' lives were harder than ours lives were. And we wouldn't want to trade with them really. And yeah. So we can be upset about some things that they did, but um, we can also have some understanding. Um, I heard a great story from someone who was in one of our workshops and it was, um, she was talking about um, uh, yelling at her kids and yelling at them and hitting them. And she really uh, was hated herself for doing this and she felt terrible. And she would say, I'm never gonna do that again. I'm never gonna do that again, but it, you know, she would just keep finding herself overwhelmed and, and doing it. And she never wanted to do it because her mother had done that to her. Her mother had yelled at her and hit her. And so then she realized, it's like, wait a minute, why did my mother do that? Because my mother did that because she was up against the wall. She was raising these kids. She didn't have any support. She didn't have enough money. She was not in good shape and, um, she didn't have help and she was overwhelmed and she didn't take care of herself. Mm. And that's when she did this. So instead of saying, I'm never going to yell, she said, I'm not going to be up against the wall. Well, this is something she could really do. Mm. She could figure out what do I need in my life so that I'm not up against the wall in that spot like my mother was. Mm. So she started taking some time to herself. She got more support. She got a friend and they was like, you take the kids today, I'll take the kids tomorrow. Mm. So they each had some free time. Um, she had another friend who every morning she would like, they would talk to each other for five minutes. That's all they had was five minutes. It's like, ah, and the other one would be like, I know what you're saying. Ah. Okay, talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> and then they'd feel better because they got that out. Oh my gosh, this is so good. <laughs> <laughs> and so she still, she's like, okay, now I'm not yelling and hitting because not because I'm strong enough and I'm better than my mom, but because I took care of myself so that I'm not yeah. up in that corner up against the wall. Mm. Such a lovely story. Mm. Um, our time is almost complete. Can I ask you one last question? Of course. I love uh, the game from your book, which is called, if I remember correctly, uh, The Love Gun, right? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Can you, can you tell about this game? Yeah, I'll tell that story. So uh, this is a very important story to me. So when my daughter was about five, um, her friend came over mm -hmm. to play and he found the only, we had a toy gun. It was like a squirt gun, a water gun. He found it right away. He was really into guns and he, came out and I was sitting on the couch. I was reading the newspaper. It was a long time ago, <laughs> reading an actual newspaper. And he, um, he aimed the gun at me and I knew it didn't have water in it because I didn't hear the water running. So I, he was aiming at me and I said, oh, you found the love gun. He said, what? And I said, oh yeah, when I get shot with that gun, I have to love the person up. Now he doesn't know what to do. He's looking at the gun and looking at me and looking at the gun and looking at me. And, um, and then he finally, he aims it and fires it at me. And I said, oh, Sam, I love you so much. And I start chasing him and <laughs> I would start to chase him and I'd fall and miss so he could run away more. And my daughter came and said, what's going on? I said, oh, Sam shot me with a love gun. Well, she didn't know what that is, but she's smart. She figured, she picked it up, but she shot me with it. So I started saying, I love you, I love you. And I got on my knees and started singing corny love songs to them. And um, they laughed and laughed and laughed. And they'd say, stop shooting us, stop shooting us, and stop loving us. And they're laughing, laughing. And then they went off, they got bored with this. They went and did something else. And I went back to my newspaper and forgot about it. And then a few weeks later, 
This boy comes over again, goes straight to the closet, gets the gun, aims it at me. And I've forgotten about the first part of the story. And I said, don't aim that at me. Even a toy gun, you should never aim it at anyone. And he said, but it's the love gun. And I said, oh, right, the love gun. And we played the whole game again. And this really taught me. And afterwards, I said, I wrote the story down because I didn't want to forget. And then I kept writing and writing, and that turned into my book, Playful Parenting. So that's why this is such an important story for me. This is so, a perfect example of how the same situation could yeah. be play around differently. Like yes. we could get mad, or you could use it to, again, to foster connection, right? Exactly. So it taught me that children always want to connect, no matter what it looks like. Hmm. And if he had really been angry, um, then he wouldn't be ready for that play. Then he would need emotional understanding. Oh, you're so angry. Let's talk about it or let's get that anger out of you and then we can talk about it and then we could play. Hmm. Um, but he was just, you know, it was this aggressive play and I forgot. You know, hmm. I thought, oh, this is dangerous. There's a gun pointing at me. So I'm just triggered into my hmm. old fears, right? So, but if I remember this is play and I can play back, mm. um, then it's a really delightful. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. That was such a lovely discussion and I laughed so much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like you are such a good storyteller. Thank you for mm -hmm. that. Thank you so much for having me and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.